Thank you, Venerable. Thank you, everybody. Please don't worry about coming in a little bit late. As long as you don't go out early. <laughs> and it's very nice to be back here again. And indeed, I do get into big trouble in many places, Venerable. Uh, I'm, I'm actually banned for one time in Singapore. They won't let me go there anymore. Because the last time I was there, so many people crowded into the temple, they broke all their fire regulations. And they were afraid that they might be back again. They'd be closed down. <laughs> I don't mind being banned for being too popular. But also memorable, when I gave a talk in Vidam a couple of years ago, they made an announcement at the same time in Jakarta, we had the pop star Lady Gaga performing. <laughs> and uh, because so many people came to my talk in Medan and Sumatra, they had to sell tickets for only like 50 cents. It was only just to make sure they could control how many people came. And my tickets sold out in two hours. Lady Gaga was took five hours to sell it. So that proves that I'm more famous and popular than Lady Gaga. <laughs> This evening and the next couple of days, I'm going to be teaching uh, mostly meditation talks uh, during the daytime, the talks about I don't know what, because when I even give a talk, I don't plan anything because life is just what happens. You don't plan life. What happens in life is it just evolves. And if you try and force it into your direction, you usually get very frustrated. If you just let life flow, then you find that everything gets very peaceful and happy. I am really thrilled for people coming late today because last week, maybe 10 days ago, I was in London and I was giving a talk in uh, the Thames Police Vihara and I was going only for maybe 10 miles, maybe 15 miles away and I got caught in a traffic jam. Three hours it took to go about 50 miles. So when I got to the talk, I only just made it on time available. And I didn't know what I was going to speak about, so I gave a talk on Buddhism and traffic jams. <laughs> because there's a lot of dharma in a traffic jam. Because number one, you realize that life is out of control. And even though you may have an important appointment, it doesn't matter. In a traffic jam, you are stuck. It's a great symbol of samsara, our world. We often get stuck. We can't go forward. We can't go back. So, enjoy being where you are. The car, the car cannot go. So if the car cannot go, let your mind not go either. The car is still, so why not let your mind be still? Because there's something I've noticed in life, which I call the in-between moments of life. These are those times where you've left where you're coming from, and you haven't arrived at your destination yet. You're in-between. It may be the time you're waiting for an appointment with the doctors sitting down in a surgery. It may be when you're waiting for your aircraft to leave. It may be when you're waiting for the talk to begin, sitting in the temple. There are so many, <coughs> sorry, so many in-between moments of our lives, like being stuck in the traffic jam. And those are great moments where we can relax. Not just in traffic jams, but I say that in every city of this world, you can see, you can come close to the teachings of the Buddha at every major intersection of every major city. It is called the Red Stop Traffic Lights. Those of you who were Buddhists for a long time, do you remember the story of Anguri Mala? He was chasing the Buddha, wanting to kill him. And what did the Buddha teach Anguri Mala? He turned around and said, Stop! 
How could he not have stopped? He became a monk, and soon he became perfectly enlightened. So every time you get caught in a red light in a traffic uh, intersection, the Buddha is teaching you. He's saying to you, stop. You've got a chance to be like Akuni Mara, to become enlightened. Every time you get caught in a red traffic light. So red traffic lights are beautiful. They're telling you to stop. And even your body is still, your heart is still, stop. Let your mind be still as well. And you have an opportunity. In fact, I, I wrote this anecdote in my first book, but it was long. And I found out that the details were in error because I got the wrong city. I did say the city of Delhi, but having gone there, I couldn't see this. But there are these things actually do occur in Bangalore in India. In Bangalore, when you come to the red traffic lights, they don't say, stop. They say, relax. They are not stop lights. They are relax lights. Now wouldn't that be a wonderful thing in Kuala Lumpur, in PJ, in the whole of Malaysia, that whenever you get caught in the red traffic lights, you don't see the word, stop. You see the word, relax. Now, can you understand the difference that does to your mind? Because when you get caught and you keep running, your mind keeps running, you can't appreciate the Dharma of the, of the traffic intersections. Telling you, remind you to stop. And even though, even though you may be in a hurry, it doesn't all go wrong. This fellow was an Australian fellow. He came and told me this story, which was a fascinating, powerful story, because it was one of these events which totally changed his life. He was a businessman, again, he was doing some business in Mumbai, in India. Having completed his business, he arranged a taxi to take him to the airport in plenty of time. But, when the taxi picked him up on time, and the taxi left to go to the airport, the taxi driver got lost. He could not find a way to the international airport. And you'd think that's the first place that taxi drivers would learn how to get to, but this must have been a taxi driver new to the job from the country, just trying to make his way in life. And they went round and 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 It was wonderful that he could see stars he'd never seen before, but that wasn't really the purpose of the journey. And the time was ticking, and it was getting more and more unlikely he would make his flight. He was getting more worried, more desperate, more excited. He was going to miss his flight, but in India, I think maybe also in Malaysia, sometimes the planes don't leave on time. <laughs> and he thought, maybe, maybe, if it's delayed as usual, then I'll make the flight. But this time, this time his flight left on schedule. Because as they made it to the airport eventually, through the window of the taxi, he could see his flight. See the tail insignia. It's fine, you can see it taking off. He was so upset. He was so angry. He was so incensed. You stupid taxi driver. You should know how to get to the airport. I've lost my flight. I'm in big trouble now. I won't be able to make my connection. Blah, 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 blah. It's very hard for a monk to actually do a story where I have to be active. <laughs> I just I try to act it out, but it's, just, it's not what I can do a monk. But anyway, he was so angry. And as he was shouting at the stupid tra taxi driver, he saw through the window of the taxi the flight he should have been on come crashing.
came down to the ground. Everybody was killed on board. This is a true story. When you saw everything, all the people coming down and crashing, everyone being killed. You wonderful taxi driver. Oh, I love you, taxi driver. Take it, see, for hundred dollars, two hundred dollars. <laughs> you saved my life. Now, this man told me that story personally several years ago, and he said that, that changed his life. Instead of thinking he was late when he got caught in a traffic jam, or he got caught in many red lights, instead of thinking he was late for making himself stressed, even angry, he remembered that. You never know what might happen if you got the wrong time. Sometimes being late may be a wonderful benefit for you, which means that he realized the dharma of traffic jams. Don't think anything is going to go wrong if you're not going to get the wrong time. Sometimes when you're late, even better things happen. That way, instead of trying to control life, we accept life. Singapore some years ago. Somebody asked me, and you can understand this from Singapore, they asked me, I haven't got much time, can you please teach me the meaning of suffering? I've got to go in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and I rose to the occasion and I said, Sir, suffering is asking from life something it can never give you. Asking from life something you can never give you. That's called suffering, that's dukkha. So please remember that. If you're in a traffic jam, you ask the traffic lights to change. They can't change just for you. In fact, they haven't got a clue who you are. They're not conscious. It's a waste of time shouting at them. It's a waste of time trying to find a quicker way. If you find that you know, the quicker way is usually the slower way. It means you're out of control. You're asking for life, something you can never give you. Because of that, that's called suffering. So instead of asking for life, something you can't give you, you actually accept life. Traffic jams, red traffic lights, being late, is part of life. Embrace it. Be kind to it. And when you are late, take advantage of it. In other words, you're late, which means that during that time in the traffic zone, you've got more time Where to relax, prepare for work, whatever else you need to do. You can sit in the car and just meditate for a few minutes. You can just you know, relax, listen to a double talk. Because it's very stressful driving through traffic. When the traffic is going very slowly, at least you know you're not going to get a speaking ticket. There's always some advantages, whatever you're doing. When you understand that, you understand why it's so important. The way there's nothing to do, then do nothing. Simple little teaching, but a lot of times when there's nothing to do, we end up doing heaps, arguing, arguing with life, blaming life, and demanding from life something it will never be able to give us. That is called suffering. So when there's nothing to do, we do nothing. We learn how to be still when the world is not moving and we don't move. When the traffic is still, we learn how to be still as well. And that means we lower our stress levels down so much. We become healthier. Now I know that sometimes when I come here, People look at me and say, Ajahn Parma, you are putting on weight. <laughs> and, well, that's not true. <laughs> this is not fact. This year I've been a big of 40 years, 40 of us, and every year you're a monk, you get more and more compassion. <clears throat> every year your heart gets a little bigger. After 40 years of compassion, my heart 
that's now so big, it's so huge, it's pushing out my stomach. <laughs> it's got to go somewhere, it just goes this way. <laughs> so it's not a fact. But learning how to be at peace with things, to be still, is really important. And the problem is, if I do look a little bit uh, around, it is only because I don't worry enough. People tell me, if you worry, 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 now your metabolism goes up, you burn a lot of fat, which means you get quite thin. But no, we must, we don't worry at all. That's one of the reasons, you know, why we look a bit round. <laughs> so, so we don't worry very much, which is really good. So if you do get sort of caught in something which you, know, you can't do, you can't control, you just let it go. I've been telling a lot of people I've been traveling, because I've been traveling so many places. Since the last full moon, Venable, this is since the last full moon I have been to England, Toronto, Montreal, Halifax, Nova Scotia, um, Hamburg, uh, to, where else did I go to? Uh, to Cambridge, uh, to uh, Sydney. There's so many places. But you know, I never go anywhere. I just sit down, the aircraft moves, not me. <laughs> so you can, you can always be still. But, when I do travel, it's really weird, in all these big cities, even in Kuala Lumpur, it's very rare, extremely rare, for me to see a human being. Very few human beings, even in Kuala Lumpur. All I ever see are human goings. Humans going somewhere, humans doing something. We're very rare to see a human being. And this is one of the problems of our modern life. We're always doing something, ticking off something on our list of things to do. Always going somewhere, changing something, making something different. So much so that we never learn how to be still and actually be here. So, learning about the still mind is learning how to be here rather than going somewhere. So, I mean, a couple of years ago, one of my disciples, they called me out. They found out I was making a mistake. They asked me when I had a bunch of papers, because if you're a senior monk, you have to do admin work as well. And they called me with a lot of papers and they said, How's it going, Ajahn Brahm? And I said, I'm getting there. Have you ever said that? And then he asked me, where actually are you getting to? That's a very deep question. Where are you getting to? I know where I'm going. My coffin. <laughs> That's where I'm going. <laughs> so that was a long answer. Too many people are getting somewhere. And not enough people are being here. So now I change my answer when they see me being busy. How are you, Ajahn Brahm? So I'm just being here. Instead of trying to get somewhere, just being here. And this reminds me of probably my favorite Buddhist joke. Now, this great these days in the Western countries, Buddhism has got so popular, there are now some legitimate Buddhist jokes which go around on the internet. And this Buddhist joke, if you haven't heard it before, is of the lay disciple who ran up the temple. And they got through to a monk and the, and the caller said, Venerable, uh, I need a monk to come to my house to do some charting. And the Venerable said, Sorry, I'm busy. And the caller said, What are you doing? And the Venerable said, I'm doing nothing. That's what monks are supposed to do. How am I supposed to teach by example? You know, we teach you to be peaceful, to let go, to relax. So we have to do the same. Otherwise, we're hypocrites. <laughs> so, very good, said the Cory. He understood about meditation. 
being peaceful, let it go. So he said, thank you, and hung up the phone. And the same caller uh, phoned the monastery the next day, got through to the same monk, said, Venerable, I really, really need a monk to come to my house to do some shanty. And the Venerable said, I'm sorry, I'm busy. He said, what are you doing today? And the Venerable said, I'm doing nothing. But that's what you were doing yesterday, said the caller. Yes, said the monk, I'm not finished yet. <laughs> and I like that joke, it's funny, but it's so profound. So in your life, when you do a list of things to do tomorrow, put at the top of the list, nothing. <laughs> do nothing first. And get that finished before you go on to the next. But how hard is it to do nothing and be still? You know, you've all lost the ability to do nothing, just to be. You're always trying to do something, get somewhere, change something, be something. So it could be something else. You never actually be in here. So there's a little technique which I developed, how to be still in your daily life. How to just be here instead of going places. And this story arose once um, I became really, really busy. Because if you look at all the responsibilities I have, it's not just one temple, it's many temples. And I call them my international franchises. <laughs> like McDonald's, it's going to be called the Browns. <laughs> But, in particular, there's two main centres in Perth I have to look after. Our city centre, a temple in the middle of Perth. Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, I have to work there. And Sunday evening, I go back to the Forest Monastery where I have to be the abbot there. Friday evening, sorry, Saturday, Sunday evening, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It's seven days a week. 365 days a year, all the time. And when anybody would visit the forest monastery where I lived, they would come up to me and say, your monastery is so beautiful, it's so peaceful, it's so serene. And I said to them, are you kidding? There's so much work to be done here. Building work, admin work, the monks are going crazy, new people need to be trained. I'm going to teach them meditation, teach them Dharma, I'm going to look after the committee, make sure they're in harmony, or I'm going to get phone calls from overseas. Sometimes if I, my dog is dying, can you charm over the phone for me? Do you know that? Well, many times. That's so much work. And so they go crazy. This is not beautiful silly monastery. This is a work camp. <laughs> and then I realized, when I responded like that, that I was the one who was wrong. I was making a big mistake. Because I forgot how to rest and be still. So what I decided to do, and this is what I encourage you to do, which you'll find out soon, once a week, for me it's usually on a Monday morning, I would pretend to be a visitor to my monastery. So then of all, one morning a week, you're not the chief priest. <laughs> you're like me, visitor. So, but two hours a week, I'd pretend to be a visiting monk. No, not the chief priest, not the abbot, not the boss. Because when I pretended to be a visitor, the whole attitude changed. I didn't have to do administration work. It's not my monastery, but I visited. Any monks were going crazy in my monastery. Nothing to do with me. I'm visiting today. Any of you 
come to visit, ask questions on meditation. I'm, I'm, I'm visiting one. I'm on the box. So you can ask somebody else your questions on meditation. Cleaning up, uh, sweeping the grounds. No, no. If you visit somebody else's place, you go to someone else's house for dinner. How many of you wash up for the afterwards? You go and visit somebody else's house for a cup of coffee. Do you cover their carpet and wash their houses and mow their lawns and do their garden for them? Of course you don't. That's their job. You're all visiting. <laughs> so, when I pretended to be a visitor, not an owner, then I could relax. And I could be free. But as soon as I was the owner, the abbot, he priest, the boss. There were so many responsibilities, I have never had time to relax at all. So the trick is, when you go home, maybe tomorrow if you have a day off, when you go home, pretend to be a visitor to the house in which you live. <laughs> Not an owner. So something needs to be mended, not my job. Dirty dishes, nothing to do with me. <laughs> There's bills to be paid. I don't live here, I'm only visiting. I don't have to worry about them. Because when you're a visitor, you can relax. When you're an owner, there's so many jobs to be done, you never find any peace at all. Now this is a very profound teaching on habitat, non-self. Where we are an owner of things, we can never find any peace. We've got too many responsibilities as an owner. And of course, many of you who study deep drama know that you don't have anything at all. But you think you do. But at least, before you're enlightened, you can pretend. Pretend to be a visitor to your house. Pretend to be a visitor to your family. Pretend to be a visitor, especially to your kids. They call you up and ask for some money. Say, so, sorry, I'm not your dad today. <laughs> for two hours. <laughs> I'm only visiting, okay? So leave me alone. <laughs> What that really means, and even if you own a body, someone has so much responsibility to our body, trying to make it healthy, trying to make it fit, trying to do all sorts of stuff, which is okay. But sometimes we just struggle so hard to make it fit, and we work so hard to make it healthy. All that worry about trying to be healthy is what makes us sick. It's a true story, there's a friend of mine. This is not good advice. Any doctors in here probably will scold me afterwards. But this is a true story. A friend of mine, he was in his 70s, and he you know, had cancer, got so bad, he eventually had to go to what we call a hospice. It's just like a facility with doctors and nurses, but there they're not going to try and cure the cancer anymore. Basically, they did not try to cure you, so you can just die peacefully and comfortably. Doctors there to alleviate pain, that any drug is okay because it's going to take the pain away. And so you can just die with dignity, not trying to recover. So this fellow, he was actually English, he went into the hospice to die with cancer. And as soon as he went into the hospice and they asked, What do you want for dinner tonight? He said, Well, I can't have too oily food because I've got high cholesterol. I can't have sweet stuff because I've got diabetes. I can't have salty things because I've got hard arteries. And then people say, what are you talking about? You're not going to die of cholesterol. You're not going to die of diabetes. You're not going to die of, of, of hard arteries. The cancer's going to get you first. So you can eat whatever you want. Really? I can eat all my favorite oily, sweet, Salty food, yes. So for the first time in about five years, he could eat all the foods he loved, all the unhealthy ones, which, why is it all the unhealthy ones are most delicious? <laughs> <laughs> because 
because he didn't love anyone, he was dying. So he was really having so much fun, he's in all the foods for his wife, especially. His wife had never let him eat for years. You know, all you guys, you know, he said, trying to put a bit of salt or another spoon of sugar in your tea, and I said, no, 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 darling, you can't. Really hard, isn't it? It's like being in prison. But, now he could eat whatever he wanted, and about two weeks later, he was released from the hospice because he got better. <laughs> the true story. Six months later, the cancer came back and they killed him, but he had made for six months. Why was that? He puts a bit of joy into his life. We don't just eat food, we eat happiness as well. And if he puts some happiness in there, that's a huge benefit for people's health. But anyway, Sometimes we worry so much about our body that that makes us sick. So here we learn how to be still with our body. Don't own it, but care for it. When you own it, you want to change it. When you visit it, you just enjoy it. Totally different perception. And to really understand it even more fully, Again, how to be still, have a still mind. It's not always wanting to change your mind. Always changing things, or develop your mind, or make it better. Now, there's a whole movement in the West now of personal development. And then what the heck are people doing? What's wrong with you? You're good enough as far as I'm concerned. You don't have to develop yourself. Love yourself for who you are. And stop trying to change and become better, whatever that means. To understand what I mean, the story of this doctor, a young Sri Lankan man, who had, you know, his parents had brought him to the temple just straight after he was born. So he grew up with me. And I'd seen him through college, and then he took a medical degree, gave him support with his exams, and then he did his first year of residency in the hospital as a doctor. And one day, during that first year of residency, he came to see me, really distressed. He wanted to give up his job and start another career. But what had happened, he'd lost his first patient. It was a tragedy. It was a young woman, maybe 23, 24, 25 years of age. And he couldn't sort of keep her going. He couldn't help her survive. She died. And he, the doctor, had to tell the husband that he had no wife anymore. The one person that this young man loved from all others gone and died. And even worse, to tell the two young children they had no money. She was dead. And that hurt him so much. He said, I, I don't think I can ever do this again. It was just too hard. And he felt so guilty. Even though he didn't deserve to feel guilty, he'd done nothing wrong. Except his attitude. I saw that straight away and I told him the job of a doctor is not to cure the patients. If you think that that is your purpose in life, to cure diseases, to cure sicknesses, you are going to fail many, many times. And you're going to go through the same feelings of suffering, of failure, and having to tell the people that you, you failed that he didn't cure their loved one. If you think that the job of a doctor is to cure, then you haven't understood. The job of a doctor is not to cure, it is to care. To care for the person you know, uh, who is in the hospital bed with your name on the top. To care for them. And if the main purpose of your life is to care, not to cure, you never need to be a failure. You may not be able to keep them alive, but you can certainly care for them. 
So change your attitude, stop caring, and stop all this curing business. And even if they deny, to die knowing you're cared for changes the whole process of death. And the family, knowing that their loved one is cared for right from the very end, is easier to accept. And of course, I think many of you have figured out yourselves, as I've been telling this story, if you care for somebody, instead of trying to cure them, the recovery rate increases. More people survive under you. But if you try and make it curing is the most important thing, then that's far too aggressive, far too negative, and more people will die. He understood it, but very smart boy. I went back to being a doctor, a specialist, and I have a wonderful family. And he asked, what do you do in hospital? I don't cure people, I care for them. Now, how many of you women have been trying to cure your husband? <laughs> How many women have been trying to cure your kids? See our mistake? Instead of curing the problem, care for people. And then the problem actually changes. Not curing, but caring. That is how you find stillness in life. When you try to cure something, you're trying to change it, you're trying to make it better. You hate the situation. And you want to make a different situation out of it. That whole attitude is the problem. You care for things. Just like you care for a, a tree, you care for a little baby, and a growing in life, you care for yourself. It's amazing just how progress, improvement happens naturally. If you try and cure it, you're trying to make it happen. And you never find any peace or stillness. Caring for something, Instead of curing the traffic jam, caring for it, letting it be, seeing its positive nature, then you find that there's no problem in the traffic jam. You can be still to be peaceful. Instead of curing it, the dirt in your house, doing all the jobs, care. Instead of trying to improve yourself, which is trying to cure yourself, care for yourself. If you care for yourself, instead of trying to kill yourself, it's a whole different ball game. I've been making a lot of um, inroads, especially into mental health. Because so I just checked my emails uh, in general book. Even I've got a, a tablet these days, you know, with all these things I'm supposed to be doing. I prefer tablets to mobile phones, because tablets I can turn them off. Turn them off and keep them off. So I can actually answer when I want to. When I send something to someone, it doesn't interfere with them. I prefer non interference with people's lives. So you just put the email down there and they can answer when they want. And they can look at it when they want instead of not on my phone. So I've got a little tablet. My favourite button on the tablet is always the delete button. It's not about being a button, but any girl would delete. It's like you know, just deleting samsara, deleting craving, deleting all your attachments. If there's only like a delete button in your head somewhere, delete all your worries, delete. Anyway, the email I got this evening, I just checked before I came out here, was from a mental health conference where I gave a keynote address recently. And they, were, they had this letter to me saying, that, you, know, you were the best speaker, thank you so much for coming. One of the things which I told them was a simile of the tree. The simile of the tree is so easy to understand. If you go into a forest or into a park, even here in Senegal, other parts of Malaysia, other parts of the world, looking for a perfect tree, one which is not crooked or bent, which is straight up, with all the branches in place and no branches broken and hanging off. With all the trees green and healthy, not with insects munching on them or brown bottle leaves. With the bark which is nice and smooth instead of scarred. 
If you can find a tree like that, you're probably in some government controlled botanical gardens. It's not natural, it's not real. The trees in the forest, in nature, are always bent and crooked with things broken, with brown leaves, and with bark, with so many scars, so much damage to the trunks of the trees. I don't know about you, but for me, those are the most beautiful trees in the whole forest. They're natural, and the crooked ones, which are bent all over the place. Do you buy those as well? They're the gorgeous ones. The meaning of that simile, if you are one of those crooked trees, bent all over the place, with branches hanging off, with a damaged bark, if you are damaged goods, as they say these days, then you are one of the beautiful trees in the forest. Welcome. How many of you would go into a forest and try and straighten up the trees. <laughs> try to get some glue, put all the broken branches back on. Get some paint and all the brown mottled stuff on the leaves and paint them all green again. Get some sandpaper or a plane and make the bark all smooth. Who would do that to a tree? It'd be mad. But that's what we do to ourselves. Try to straighten ourselves up to take all the crooked stuff out, to try and mend all the damage from our past, which makes us the beautiful people we are today. Stop trying to improve yourself. Instead, care for yourself and realize you're all crooked and bent, and that's what makes you lovable. <laughs> this is basic compassion, loving kindness. Because trying to improve yourself is endless. Loving yourself, caring for yourself, instead of caring for yourself, that you can be successful. That has an end. That's peace that leads to stillness. How can you be stillness? How can you be still when you've got so many jobs to be done? I've got lots of jobs to be done. Oh, if I look at all the emails I have to answer. You know, I have many, many responses. How many monasteries do you have to look after? Oh, venerable, so many monasteries I have to look after. And people keep opening new ones. They, I've got some, they've got about five in Australia now. You've got sort of the Lance Monastery in Dhammasara. You've got the city centre, I've got my monastery, I've got the retreat centre, there's another monastery over in Sydney, Santi Monastery, and there's a new one opened up outside of Melbourne, and there's the people in Singapore, there's the Body Young International Foundation in Hong Kong, and also, I don't know what they call this, the Brahm Internet Cafe in, um, in uh, Seoul, in Korea. There's a Brahm Society in Colombo, Another one opened up somewhere, I forget now. So many responsibilities. So many. Bad for me. I only work there two hours a week, the rest of the time I'm only busy. This is that when you learn how to let go, you can be still, even with all that responsibility. When you learn not to own, when you learn not to cure, but to care. You only have one moment in life. There is now. In that moment, you have a choice to be still or to put on stillness and peace until another time, which never comes. Which is why I prioritize stillness and peace. I don't have to cure things. I care for things. I care for myself care for others, and that's the way you find peace in life. And for those of you who have peace, who have moments of stillness, just how beautiful they are. But everybody has had some time in their life. I call it the time when you consider there was no other place you'd rather be. There was no 
other people who'd rather be with us. No other time is moments of contentment when basically he didn't want anything. Maybe the wanting came back later. There were times when everything was just moments of good enough. It gives you a taste of freedom, a taste of what stillness can be, what peace can be. You don't, you don't have to have perfect people around you. You don't have to improve yourself. You don't have to change the world to find those moments of peace. They're here for you at any time. You just recognize that to care is more important than to cure. Care for this moment, and then you've got no work to do. You do your acts. Care for being in the traffic jam. Don't try and get out of it. Learn to make peace. You can make peace anywhere, at any time, in any situation. When you learn how to just let go and try and cure yourself and cure others. It's wonderful in a family to, to sometimes in a family life we always try and cure, cure our partner instead of caring for them. I'm just going to finish off with another quick story. If any of you are thinking of getting married, or are married already, and you've been arguing with each other, or you think you're getting married, you don't want to argue with each other. I recently found out a very beautiful, simple way of having a marriage without arguments. So simple. Within a marriage, husbands and wife, you always want to be right. People see things from different angles. You can't both be right all the time. So this way is sharing being right. So if you're having an argument in your family, husband and wife arguing about something, look at the calendar and make an agreement. If it is an odd day of the month, the 1st, the 3rd, the 5th, the 7th, the 9th, the 11th, the 13th, and so on, then she is right. If it's an even day of the month, 7, 4, 6, 8, 10, then he is right. And then the calendar decides you don't need to argue. So what day is it today? Is it the 9th or 7th today? 7, so 7, the woman is always right. <laughs> Tomorrow, the 8th, the man is always right. And that way, you don't have to argue who's right, who's wrong. The calendar decides and you're just right and wrong, pretty much evenly. So you both take turns and be right or be wrong. And that's what really gets to people. So why is he always right? Why is he always right? And that joke of the woman who married Mr. Right. <laughs> you know, he's always right. <laughs> that's Mr. Right. So that's a nice way of learning how to have a happy marriage. Okay, so if any of you are getting married or your kids are getting married, please tell them that. <laughs> and the women like that because you probably all worked out already. And because of that, the women provide more for the men. It's only a few days a year, so it's about to give you in there. Okay, so thank you for listening to How to Have a Still Mind. There's more talks coming the next day and the day afterwards. But that's a good time to pause for a while and ask for the best time of any talk, the questions and answers. So thank you for that part. Now, go on. We're going to clap, clap. Okay, now some questions and answers. This is no questions this evening. Everyone must be invited so I don't go tomorrow. <laughs> yes, thank you.
several months. So I discovered it by starting in the car, right? Before in the traffic jam, right? It helped me in several ways. The last time I used to get uh, speed track driving the shoulder, get the least arm on the car. So what happened is, is it the right thing to do? I mean, skipping is a thing myself, I think more chanting, but still chanting, I, as I travel, I chant, then I find that uh, I better improve myself. Is that right? I think it's an excellent idea. He's saying, for those of you who couldn't hear in the back, that he found life very busy, so instead of discipline, disciplining himself, getting up earlier, doing some chanting before he went to work, because he gets caught in traffic jams, he does his chanting in the traffic jam. <laughs> it's multitasking. <laughs> he said, well, I think it's a wonderful thing to do. It's being kind to yourself, and I know many people who pray in the KL traffic. <laughs> the need to is dangerous sometimes. <laughs> so, why not? It's a very good thing to do. And when you're chanting, you calm down, which means you don't get road rage, you don't do stupid things. But sometimes people get so upset, I've seen people get so upset in traffic. They get so tense, it's bad for your health. It's bad for your mental health. You get angry. Now, it's not just chant on the way to work, chant on the way back as well. So that when you get home, you're nice and peaceful, and you're holy when you get back to see your wife and kids, instead of being a monster <laughs> coming back from work. It's a very good idea. So yeah, why not do that? You can say, is it being respectful to the chanter? I think he is being respectful in our modern age. We respect his meaning. Because the Buddha wanted us to be peaceful, wanted us to be happy. And February, it was a few years ago when I came here, there was a seminar for, for youth, Buddhist youth. And it was about maybe four or five hundred, fifty to twenty-five year olds. And in that seminar, they asked the youth, what is your biggest emotional problem? And they, they wrote, the vast majority wrote, the biggest emotional problem as a 15 to 25 year old in the Klang Valley was tiredness. And that just opened up a huge area where I could help people stop their suffering. And each one of you, too, that's probably the core reason for many physical sicknesses, social uh, problems with husbands, with wives, with kids, with parents, and uh, with also mental illness as well, like depression. Everyone is so tired these days. Which is one of the reasons I think it's a great thing to do an extra half an hour in bed, do your chanting in the car. So you're not one of those who's going to die or get sick the byproducts of the biggest disease in our modern world, tiredness. We don't know how to relax. We've got so many things we have to do these days. Most people just can't get up in the morning without a cup of coffee. They're just a monster, they're not really alert. We did used to have coffee. But we have so much work to do now. So, really. Most people's grumpiness and anger, it all comes from being tired. You give yourself a good rest, a good sleep, you sleep a you know, full night's sleep, a good night's sleep, you're always so happy afterwards. And also, you're much healthier with a good night's sleep. So, one of the biggest problems in our modern world in places like Planet Valley, in modern country in Malaysia, again, one of us was just tired. We're running on empty. So when you do have a holiday, you have a vacation, don't go to Europe, don't come to Australia, stay at home. <laughs> you spend so much money on your apartment, on your house, and there's no place like home. There's no bed as comfortable as your own bed. There's no food as nice as home cooking. 
So why did you go to all these restaurants? Why did you go out there in the traffic again? Why did you go out overseas? That's one thing I can't understand for anymore. I see the people in Australia, they go to KL to do shopping. I give them KL, go to Australia to do shopping. <laughs> There's something wrong there. <laughs> so they've got a nice house on holiday, just staying out. But no work, I don't know. No cleaning. Just <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe a little bit cleaning. But just have a nice time to go. So they don't have to go to the airport, queue up, go through the customs and the immigration all that sort of stuff. You don't have to wait for the train, you don't have to be told it's late, you don't have to be stuck next to this fat person in the economy class. You can't get out. They have to be, you know, once I was flying to London, this enormous woman, I was actually in a window seat, the enormous woman sat next to me. I couldn't get out for hours. I needed to go to the toilet. So I was, I was really aware Waiting, you know, poised like a cat ready to pounce. As soon as this person got out and went to the toilet, I got out to my ran. I made sure I got my business done quickly so I could get back to my seat before she blocked it off again. <laughs> so, you know, flying around the world, there's not really good seat for that. Got a nice hole, enjoy it. You're on holiday. Yeah. Okay, another question? When it comes to stillness, there's a little thing which uh, to do some, uh, if we'll make some deeper dharma, there's something uh, in the Eightfold Path, the core teachings of Buddhism, now, the last factor is called Sama Samadhi. And for many, many, many years, People have been translating that into English as why concentration. And it's not concentration at all. That word has caused a lot of problems for people when they're meditating. So much so venerable that when you go to a meditation retreat, it does actually become a concentration camp. <laughs> it's not nice. And sometimes people get so tense. The whole idea of concentration is something that you force the mind to do. It's not peaceful at all. So the, the real meaning of samadhi is stillness. Stillness, not concentration. And I've been saying that for such a long time now. There was a uh, Chinese professor from MIT, you know, in Boston. She said, of course it needs stillness because she's been studying the equivalent of our Pali Jupitaka in the Chinese version. Because all those ancient texts were taken over to China now, many, many, many centuries ago and translated. And they always translate the word samadhi as stillness. So, with the last factor, what meditation does is learn how to be still. Not learning how to concentrate. And there's a quick little demonstration. Many of you may have seen me do this before, but usually on retreats, not just on an evening talk. It's a very simple demonstration. And I need your help. And I think I did this last time I was here. I'm now going to hold this cup of water vertically still. And uh, then, what can you tell me when it's not moving? Because it's not moving yet. Be I'd be honest, you know. <laughs> and it's not moving yet. No, wait, I get two glasses. <laughs> no, I need an independent touch, it's still moving. So now I'm going to concentrate. <laughs> I'll see you in the Now, many people try to be still. Trying to meditate, this is their problem. They try even harder and it gets worse. 
This is not the way to achieve a still nice of water. And of course, you should all know how to keep this water perfectly still. Just pull it out. You let it go. You stop trying. You just disengage. Let it go. Put it down. And you'll find that it's perfectly still. There's no way I can hold that water that still. That is how to be still. Don't try to be still. Stop all the trying. And your water becomes still, just like your mind, all by itself. That's the trick of meditation. Concentration is something you do. Stillness is what happens when you stop doing things. Which is why today I give you little tricks, like don't be a no, don't be a visitor. Little tricks, you know, just like, um, what else am I saying? Caring instead of curing. Curing is doing something. Caring is letting things be. And that sometimes uh, we have this way we teach meta meditation, which is what? May all beings be happy and well, we say. That is very unkind. Some people do not want to be happy. <laughs> and you're trying to make them happy. And that really makes them upset. This actually happened recently. I was teaching a retreat. And I was teaching, oh, you know, we do a little bit of loving kindness, may all people be happy and well. And it made this Indonesian girl even more upset. She came to see me in interviews saying, Look, I just feel grumpy. I feel upset. And every time you say I should be happy, I feel more guilty, more of a failure, and I feel terrible. So I saw the problem. I said, Can you please just wait here for one minute? I went into my office, got on the computer, and I printed out what became known as a grumpy license. On a letter-headed paper, it wrote and said something like, This license permits the following person, and I wrote down her name, permission to be grumpy for any reason or no reason at all for the rest of her life, so I met her grump. <laughs> that was kindness. Allowing her to be grumpy. And of course, as soon as I cared for her and said, well, you don't have to be happy, you don't have to be worried, be grumpy if you want. Stop trying to change yourself. And as soon as I gave her the grumpy license, she smiled and she was so happy, <laughs> all her grumpy was vanished. You see the psychology of that? So sometimes when we say, may like, all oh, people be happy and well, that really hurts. Many people. We feel failures, we've still got some stuff to do. Or just like you, you write a get well card to someone, please get well soon. That really puts some pressure on you. It's not just being get well, you've got to get well quickly. <laughs> so next time, next time you send a card to someone, your husband said, get well if you want to, but you can be sick if you like. <laughs> Take the pressure on them. <laughs> it's like a somebody point of that. Go to visit someone in the hospital. And please, never do this. Don't go and say, how are you feeling today? <laughs> That's the dumbest question on this planet. <laughs> People in the hospital, they're sick. Of course they're feeling warm, otherwise if they weren't feeling warm, take them out. So don't, don't tell them that. So if you go and see someone in the hospital, you know, the, our visiting, when we visit our friends and relations, is wrong. If you're in the hospital and someone comes to visit you, you should never talk about the sickness. Talk about the person. You sometimes say, what's the latest diagnosis? Now what's your, your uh, white blood cell count? What is it? You 
don't want to know that. There's doctors and nurses, they do all that stuff. You're their friend, you're not a medical practitioner. So you just talk to them as you talk to them if you're in a, a cup of coffee together. You know, just talk about the gossip, talk about the football, or talk about whatever you normally talk to a person about. And that way, they enjoy your company. It's not some other sort of medical practitioner visiting them, it's their friend. So please, if you come and see you know, the family in hospital, me in hospital at the time, don't come and ask us how I'm feeling today. <laughs> please give us permission to be sick. <laughs> I feel a lot of pressure on you to so Mark was out to be healthy. It's always like I feel guilty if he gets sick as a meditator. So, this is where nothing comes. Just open the door of your heart to someone as they are. Not putting pressure on them to be different. Not curing them, but caring for them. You do that to yourself as well. And that's where you become peaceful. That's where you become still. And that's where all the healing happens. Not by trying to cure, but by caring. So if anyone wants a grumpy license, <laughs> my latest book, Venable, it's uh, out on Amazon. It's called Don't Worry, Be Grumpy. <laughs> 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 and in the back of every book, there's a license, already fitted out, you can put your own name in, pre signed, so you can take it out, I'll give you permission for the whole world to be grumpy. <laughs> So, another comment or question? Yeah. And the monk 
was kept away by his brother's story. He did that. And he couldn't sleep at all. You know, for an hour or something, and then he remembered. So the teachings of the Buddha, but I had taught him as well. He said, look, it's not the sound that disturbs you, it's you who disturbing the sound. By changing the attitude, you can find some peace. So he decided to use his powers of perception to change the way he looked at the snoring of his elder brother. He started to imagine that it was like some modern music. There was an avant-garde symphony. They're done by some of these artists these days. I don't know what they do, but it sounds like snoring to me sometimes. Until, by changing his perception, the snoring became actually quite melodious. And he was actually enjoying it. And that's the last thing he remembered when he woke up in the morning. He sent him to sleep, because he just changed the attitude. He couldn't change the snoring, because that's what people do. He changed the attitude towards it, but it solved the problem. So sometimes you can't change the kid. And that's the problem trying to change it, because that's just asking for the world something it can never give So 
trying to trust the kid. This needs to happen on your own all the time. So, just like I said, only for two hours a week, I'm a visitor, I'm an owner. Maybe for one or two hours a day, you're not mummy anymore, you're just a visitor. <laughs> so, you can meditate all you want. Yes, go on. <laughs> Theory of relativity. 
You don't need to understand it, know that everybody, everybody in science knows space is curved, so it's got finite volume, but no edges. It answered the problem I had as a kid. How was at the end of the universe? So many people, we moved from flat Earth to round Earth. Many people are still flat space. Now they've got round space. Now the reason I started this, let's go to the next stage. Time. Too many people still believe the perception is flat time. With a beginning and an end. With edges. And just like a boundary to the universe never made sense to me. How can it be a wall and an edge? What was beyond that edge? If there's a beginning and end of time, what was before the beginning? What was beyond the end? And that is something which has stumped philosophers and theosophists, theosophers for centuries. But now that we change our perceptions, instead of having flat time, curved time, just like the soccer ball, finite duration, but with no edges, no beginnings, no ends to time. Time too is curved. And that solves the problem of creations, beginnings, and endings of things. And that is philosophically so beautiful, and it's also true. It solves so many problems in religion, so many problems in philosophy. So the whole nature of time can be curved. When have you done any physics at all, Einstein's special theory? Time for one person is not the same as time for others. Depends on how fast you go. We've got the famous twins paradox. Two twins, one gets put in a rocket, sent maybe a couple of light years away, comes back again, and one twin has aged ten years, and they've only aged one year. Ten years on Earth has passed, but for them it's like one year. Time is not absolute. Time is relative to the observer as well. Time does get bent, stretched. That is one of the reasons why in November, in some of the heavy realms, I will say 50 years of human life is like one day in the realm of the four great kings. Time has changes with people. And that especially happens in meditation. In meditation, when you really get deep in meditation, you can sit for hours. And it doesn't feel like hours at all. I love telling weird stories because people love weird stories. But recently, a few years ago actually, in Australia, a Vietnamese monk taught a meditation retreat, a nine-day retreat. And usually these nine day retreats, they start with um, half an hour meditation, maybe about 7.30, 8 o'clock the talk, the first talk, and then the first night early to bed. So they all been in the hall, 7.30, they started the meditation. 8 o'clock, the monk had come out of meditation. And all the people were waiting for the talk. 8.30, still had come out, 9 o'clock, he was still meditating. So everyone went to bed. They left the muck up there. When they got up in the morning for the first six in the morning, he was still meditating there and moved. He did not move for eight days. <laughs> didn't go to the toilet, didn't eat or drink anything. He sat there like a Buddha statue for eight whole days. When he did come out of his meditation, he said, Sorry, so I was supposed to give you a talk, but I don't know, I was just really still, didn't realize such a long time ago passed. And all the people there on the retreat said, Oh, Bante, oh, that was so inspiring to see that such things can still happen today. So he got into deep meditation. But when you do go into deep meditations, time has no meaning at all. Because all what time is, is a measurement between the past and the present, between the present.
present and the future, or between the past and the future. In meditation, there's no past, there's no future, there's only this present moment. You just can't measure anything anymore. So that part of time being measurement, or duration, and distance between one moment and another moment, that's all gone. You just have this moment, that's all. Time vanishes. That's why you can meditate for hours. You're perfectly aware. You're not asleep. Perfectly aware. Not like under anesthetic. We don't know how many hours we've been out. Perfectly aware. But still, time vanishes. It's great when time vanishes. Time is a pain in the bar. <laughs> Never, never enough time. You know, when you're busy doing things, you're always in a rush to get somewhere. So when time vanishes, ooh, free from the prison of time. The prison is. Yeah. So I don't just do jokes, I've got some weird stories as well. <laughs> Been a month a long time now. Any other questions about interesting stuff? Any other meaning of life, creation? You don't have to have creation because they'll be giving you time. Question solved. So, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> How's the time going? Oh, it's still another 20 minutes, 15 minutes. There's people who have got a better. So, another question you want to ask? It's really nice actually having um, studied theoretical physics at Cambridge and now being a Buddhist monk. So I can actually get those two together. You understand both very, very deeply. And that's why I love going to um, conferences, which are not Buddhist conferences, like science conferences. We're really getting into this. We're trying to influence scientists. And for the Buddhist, uh, I see absolutely no contradiction at all between what the Buddha taught and modern science. Especially to our senses about reincarnation. The evidence is there. It is compelling. There's many, many people. For instance, I don't think I've told this story here because this was only very recently available. There is uh, one of our members, he's only on the edge for a while, but now he really wants to be on our committee next year. Uh, he was uh, what's called SAS Reservist. SAS is Special Air Services in Australia. It was like the, the US Navy SEALs. These are the guys who do black ops, go and do stuff in places like Iraq and Syria, which are not reported. Really, the tough guys. And uh, he uh, he had a brother who was having some emotional problems, and psychologists couldn't really help him. And he had heard that through what's called hypnotic regression, hypnotize someone and take them back into a, what they claim to be a previous life. And whether it is a previous life or not. It certainly solves the emotional problems or phobias. They may be they just so afraid of say going in an aircraft. And that really hinders them to going off on holiday, going off on business. They regress them to a previous life and find they died in a plane crash or whatever. And then when they experience that themselves, the phobia either goes completely or it gets lessened. So this guy is uh, Brother had a phobia, and he thought, well, maybe hypnotic regression might help him. But before I, I um, suggest this to my brother, I want to try it out for myself. So this um, businessman, maybe in his 30s, Caucasian, uh, totally conservative, an SAS reservist, you know, he went on an operation, exercise, anti terrorist exercise, first of all. So that's probably one of the reasons he was so exhausted that when he had an appointment with the <coughs> hypnotic invention, he says, one of my close friends used to be an ex-president of my Buddhist society in Perth. Straight away, he was 
was easy to put into a trance. Very quickly, he started to recall things. What he recalled was something he could never really have imagined. He recalled, first of all, on a pier, seeing red coats, British soldiers of Nabebeha 20, 30 years ago. And, you know, the therapist that asked, what's the year? He gave the year. What are you wearing? He's wearing a brown uniform, which is really weird. It turns out later on, at that time, it was only when the British Army used to wear those red uniforms, it was only a certain time, and that was the time there would have been in this place, actually it was in Fremantle, which was the poor city of Perth. And the ground uniform was really weird, but he managed to go to the library and find out there was a group of volunteers, which uh, Britain uh, would ask people to volunteer for three years as prison guards to the convicts of Australia. And if they served three years uh, in these far colonies, basically guarding the convicts. And after those three years of service, they were given a grant of land so they could start farming and start having a life. He remembered himself as a, maybe the sixth or seventh son of a, a, a Catholic family in Ireland, but basically so poor, no hope, he decided to actually to volunteer to go ways away from his family to the other side of the world as one of these brown uniformed guards. And he remembered meeting his wife in the pub. He recalled all the names, moving after three years of service, moving to the south of uh, Western Australia, where he built his own farm, so built his own stone house with next to the village. After that, he retired to the town of Albany, where he had another house. With total recall of all the names, the places, and the dates. And now, when he you know, remembered all this stuff, he didn't believe it at first. He didn't believe in reincarnation. But, if that happens to you, of course you want to find out. And records are actually there, there's libraries where you can actually research this. And so you've got all these old documents, and even a photo, an old photo of these brown uniform people. It was there. The name, the marriage license, the house was on the old deeds. This is his name, sort of old name. He even remembered his grave. Gravestone. He said he hasn't been there yet, but really waiting for him to go and see his own grave. So it's me under there in the previous life. But it's totally convinced him. And the interesting thing he told us that once, you no, know, he didn't believe in reincarnation before, when you have all that information for some, and it checks out 100%, he said, now he has to keep the pencil. He says that with resignation. So that, I used to like a beer every now and again, but I just can't do it anymore. Because now I know that I'm going to get reborn again. And his level of morality has just improved so much. Now he's actually remembered about previous lives and how it all works. And he's basically, he knows what happens if he breaks his precepts. He's seen it. So there's evidence like that. I've only said one piece of evidence. There's huge amounts of evidence. And why people cannot accept that is again simply because same reason why for years, decades, people could not accept that this planet Earth was round. They could not accept that the Earth goes around the sun. And they actually so we had to torture Galileo when he started suggesting that. Sometimes there's a resistance to evidence. The evidence is compelling. So also I like talking to scientists about that, how it works, why well, you have to accept these things. So you have 
be drawn this long. <laughs> Who were you? Now, why is it that I can go out and to spend so much time in the lazy? Why are you here, General? <laughs> is it you were here before? <laughs> <laughs> There's so many stories about people making fast ones. They're fascinating. There's so many of them, I don't know why people don't know, just accept them. They make life give you the bigger picture. And it makes it quite clear what we should be doing. I mean, if you have a bit of a, a tough time in this life, don't worry, you have another go afterwards. It's like if you're at school and you find an exam, do it again next year. So, you know, sometimes people have got tragedies in life, and they think that moves their life as a man, you have another go. Sometimes a child dies in some tragedy or accident, you think, well, oh, that's terrible. Such a tragedy, only four or five years of age, or maybe 12 or 18, and just started out in life and they die. That'd be really mean if I only had one go. I didn't have an opportunity to have another try. Of course, I do have many opportunities to try again. Kids who commit suicide. That's one of the big scourges of our modern, modern world. I know in Singapore it's a big problem, I'm sure in KO is the same. Is it the same for these suicides? Young, <coughs> young people. If that's your son, that's your daughter. Now that's a, that makes it worse. If you think, right, well, that's it, they've just wasted a life, they have no other chance. If you think they can get reborn and try again, maybe do better next time. Then that makes it a bit more acceptable. It's still a tragedy, but it makes it a little less harsh. Just right. I adapted that last Friday in Perth. This woman came up. She was really, really upset. She was going through a divorce. Um, for a woman and a man, that's one of the toughest emotional challenges ever to go through a divorce. So I told her to change your perception. Don't call it divorce, call it recycling. <laughs> Recycling. She started laughing. All her pain vanished. She thought, this is one crazy muck I've come to talk to. <laughs> so next time, if any of you go through divorce, don't call it divorce. Call it recycling. Because <laughs> the what ends, something else begins afterwards. <laughs> Anything else coming up? Make sure you finish off for today, first night, 10 o'clock. You're in charge, for anymore. <laughs> this is a trouble. I told them about being a visitor. <laughs> and that is not taking responsibility. <laughs>